Thank you. Uh, my name is Natasha Devon, and I have a made-up job. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I invented it. So what I do is I go into about three schools, colleges, and universities throughout the UK every single week. And whilst I'm in there, I conduct research with students, teachers, and parents, asking them what's missing in terms of their pastoral care and well-being, and what would help them, whether that's education, whether that's classes, or whether that's um, a change change to the school environment. Um, I then deliver some of those practices. I see what works and what doesn't, and I feed that information back to a number of organizations that I work with. Um, the reason that I do this job actually um, arises out of my own experience. I have a mental illness. I have um, generalized anxiety and panic disorder. GAPD is what my doctor calls it. That's the pathologized term. I call it Nigel. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the reason for that is one of the key characteristics of my anxiety disorder is that I get this lump in my throat that makes it quite difficult for me to breathe. And I, I don't know about you, but I find that I need to breathe often. <laughs> so if I can't breathe, that's very frightening to me. And I found that I'd reached a stage where the fear of having a panic attack was actually inducing more anxiety. So it had become this, this horrible, vicious circle. So I was working with a counsellor to try and address this, and my counsellor said to me, you know what you need to do? You need to anthropomorphize your mental illness because if you give it human characteristics, it will become less scary. So she said to me, if your mental illness was a person, who would it be? And my first response was Ursula the Sea Witch from The Little Mermaid. <laughs> But bearing in mind, one must always be mindful of one's inner child and what they would think of the situation. My therapist said to me, no, no, Ursula the Sea Witch is too scary because she has genuine power. She has a fork that shoots electricity out the top, sucks out your soul, turns it into a bogey. That's scary. What you need is someone who's evil, yes, but you need a figure of fun, someone that you can laugh at. So I decided instead to name it after Nigel Farage. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> The further you take that analogy, the more it works. Always arrives in a great tidal wave of irrational thought, constantly demands alcohol but shouldn't be given it because it only makes it worse. And just when you think you've got rid of it, it pops up again. And looking back, I have, I've lived with Nigel since I was about 10 years old. In, in my last year of primary school, I was actually diagnosed with asthma because I was having difficulty breathing. And I was given an inhaler, which I was really chuffed with because I don't know if any of you were children of the 80s, but an inhaler was the ultimate playground accessory. <laughs> I thought I was it with my inhaler and I was using it all the time. Uh, but it didn't work because I didn't have asthma. I had Nigel. And I was left to muddle through because back then, mental illness wasn't understood or spoken about in the same way that it is today. We know now, for example, that eight out of 10 children in primary school who go to their school nurse with a stomachache are experiencing anxiety. That's something that's widely understood. Back then, that kind of knowledge didn't exist. But I think one of the reasons I was able to cope and one of the reasons I'm so passionate about giving young people a positive and nurturing school environment is because I had such a great experience of secondary school. In secondary school, I existed in an environment where I felt noticed, appreciated. I would go so far as to say loved. And that's what enabled me to survive those thorny teenage years. It was only when I went to university and the tectonic plates of my life shifted, suddenly I'm in a new environment that might as well have been Mars. You know, I grew up in a very small village in Essex called Ugly. <laughs> It exists, look it up, it's near Stansted Airport. And we're most famous for having an ugly women's institute. <laughs> it's a little farming village. And I went to university in Aberystwyth uh, in Wales, which might as well have been a different planet. And I'm there, I'm in a new environment with new people, and I'm trying to establish a new identity. And I got a, a very good indication there of where I was at with my mental health. And I developed what I now understand was a terrible coping mechanism for anxiety in the form of an eating disorder which took me seven years to fully recover from. And at the end of that seven years, I started to reflect on what it was that had brought me to that point. And I came to the conclusion that a lot of it had to do with the othering that we do of people with mental illnesses. I was very lucky in that I had some mental health education at school. But what it consisted of is we had a couple of people who came in, they did an assembly, and they spent an hour telling us about their experiences. And they were always quite dramatic. There was one guy who he had been on the streets temporarily because of his drug and alcohol addiction 
nutrition issues. There was another lady who'd nearly died of anorexia. And we were teenagers, and they were juicy stories. So of course we were engaged with them. But we didn't apply them to ourselves. We looked at those people, and we thought, that's what someone with mental illness looks like. I'm not like them. This isn't relevant to me. And then I thought about how we teach physical health and how different that is. By the time children are about five, they're told about things like healthy eating and drinking enough water and taking regular exercise. Because we acknowledge that we all have a body and therefore we all have a physical health. And it occurred to me that mental health shouldn't be any different. Because whilst one in four people statistically will experience mental illness, four in four people have got a head with a brain in it. And that means that four in four people have got a mental health. And this is a universally relevant conversation. So the idea behind the work I'm doing with schools is to try and make it grassroots, to try and make it relevant to every single young person so we can all be part of this conversation. Now, just last week in the UK, some government-funded research came out of the University of Central London, which showed that a quarter of girls and one in 10 boys are showing symptoms of depression by the time they reach the age of 14. And that's inevitably led to some questions about what has caused that. And the answer is we don't really know. And the reason for that is because of the amount of money that's put in to research. For every £2,000 that's put into cancer research in the UK, only £10 is put into mental health research. And that's despite the fact that they affect approximately an equivocal proportion of the population. So a lot of the time when we're trying to discover what it is that causes poor mental health, it's conjecture. We're feeling in the dark. But one thing that we do know is that it has increased by half. Um, not by half, sorry, but it's doubled uh, in the past 10 years. And something must be causing that. Now, a lot of people, including Jeremy Hunt, <laughs> I pronounced it right, yay, um, who is the, um, <laughs> the Secretary for Health over in the UK, um, point the finger firmly at social media. Now, I'm not here to tell you that social media isn't a factor. Of course it is. In fact, there are a lot of people um, who point to this individualistic, consumerist, capitalist society that we live in and say that low self-esteem, addiction, depression, anxiety are the natural consequence of constantly being told that you're not good enough and that you need to consume in order to rectify that. And most of us are carrying around a smartphone which beams those toxic messages into our consciousness consciousness 24 hours a day. So within that context, of course it's not surprising that poor mental health is on the rise. However, I think to point the finger at social media conveniently absolves the government of some of their responsibility to look at the wider issues. I was briefly the government's mental health champion for schools. I was advising the Department for Education um, on mental health policy. And the conclusion that I reached was that the government had to start looking outside of education and outside of health. We know that there is an established link between economic deprivation and poor mental health. I've heard some talks today about how poor mental health has risen in Ireland since austerity measures were put in place. We've got one million children in the UK living in poverty, 2.3 million who would be classified as poor, and that's set to rise by 23% by 2020. The University of Oxford have told us that despite having the fifth largest economy in the world, we are a society that's in danger of becoming permanently divided, that children's prospects are more or less set by their financial circumstances at the time of birth. So I said to the government, if you are as invested as you appear to be from this big, giant public relations campaign that you've launched, all this time and energy you've put into seeming like you care about young people's mental health, you might want to look at your economic policy and austerity. And uh, this was their response. He fired me. Um, <laughs> nine months I lasted, which is how long it takes to grow a baby and com become completely disillusioned with the political system. <laughs> And my firing happened to coincide with a time when there was a big discussion happening about what is happening in education. So there was a much more strict testing regime being introduced, particularly in primary schools. And a lot of parents in particular weren't happy about it. And what I'm going to show you now is a video that was made by Channel 4, which tells you that story reached a stage where one in 10 young people has a diagnosed mental illness. There are many more that never even reach diagnosis but struggle behind closed doors. And we see that in schools every single day. In 
in your bedroom, you self harm. The argument is they're trying to raise standards across the board. Yes, but the increasingly anxiety and the pressure of our children is making them not want to go to school, it's making them stressed, it's making them nervous. At one end of the scale, we've got four-year-olds being tested. At the other end of the scale, we've got teenagers leaving school, facing the prospect of leaving university with record amounts of debt. Anxiety is the fastest growing illness in under 21s. Things are not a coincidence. Now these opinions that I'm presenting to you today, they aren't new. I've said it all in, in my columns for the Times Educational Supplement and at government level, I've said this. And they haven't made me very popular in certain circles, but I will continue to say them, because it's too important not to. Education doesn't mean anything unless it happens within the context of a healthy mind. And that final statement you see there transpired to be total bollocks. <laughs> um, I did a freedom of information request after I was fired by the government and I absolutely was let go because of my criticism of policy. And at one point they said um, that I was enjoying my 15 minutes of fame uh, over the furore of this um, and that hopefully they were now at an end. But unfortunately uh, for the government, um, this only increased my profile and I've been talking about it ever since. And I have three key levels, or, uh, <laughs> I have three key areas of concern in terms of my current day campaigning. The first is teacher stress levels. It seems to me that what austerity has done is it's taken away the support that schools have within the community. Children and adolescent mental health services, social services, even things like libraries, things that would have provided an outside space where children and families can seek the kind of emotional support that they need. Now schools are the last bastion of a community that can be relied upon to stay open. So it seems to me that whenever a sacrifice was made in the name of austerity, the attitude was very much, well, teachers can do that. Teachers can do that. So we've got this thing happening where there's teachers who've been in the profession for a very long time who are saying, well, hang on, I trained to be a geography teacher and suddenly I'm expected to be a social worker and a therapist. This is not what I signed up for. And so they're leaving. You've got teachers who are coming into the profession who understand that the role has now expanded and that there are more things in the remit, but so much is being expected of them and they're attacking it with such enthusiasm enthusiasm that they're burning out after a couple of years, so they're leaving, and it's the teachers in the middle who are expected to pick up that slack, and they are enduring huge amounts of stress levels. It's been found recently by the BBC that 70% of British teachers have taken time off in the past year for a physical or mental health problem, which they directly attribute to the stress of their job. So we want to reduce stress levels and anxiety levels in young people. We have to look at the stress and anxiety levels of the people who are caring for them. My second level of concern is that things which we know are good for our mental health, both in maintaining mental health, but also in combating mental ill health, sport, art, music, drama, are being squeezed out of the curriculum. There's been this emphasis on core academic subjects, and it's meant that the average state school child in the UK does only one hour of physical education per week. That is nowhere near enough. And what Nikki Morgan has done with her character education agenda is she's ensured that every child knows how important it is that they take time for relaxation and for physical activity, but other changes to the education system mean that they don't have the time and space to be able to develop those habits. So what we're doing is we're throwing that ball back to vulnerable people. We're saying to the people who are experiencing poor mental health, you know, you really need to exercise more. You need to take more time for relaxation. You need to involve yourself in creative projects. But we, as the adults, are not creating an environment where it's easy or even possible for them to do that. So we need to re-establish these things into the curriculum. My third thing is to consider boys and men. Now, that statistic I quoted at the beginning, one in 10 boys, as opposed to a quarter of girls, exhibit symptoms of poor mental health by the time they're 14. 
mean. Um, that would suggest that the prevalence is higher in girls. But suicide is the biggest killer of men under 50 in the UK. 90% of suicides happen as a result of undiagnosed depression or untreated depression. And 50% of depression begins before the age of 14. So that tells us something. That tells us that boys are suffering, but we are not using the language or engaging in the activities which is allowing them to communicate that to us. So I'm looking at ways that we can shape the environment because I think where mental health interventions aimed at men are getting it wrong is they're saying to men, do you know what men, you really need to start talking about how you feel, as though it's as simple as they would rather kill themselves than have a chat. And that's not how it works. There is something about the world that boys and men inhabit which makes it incredibly difficult for them to do that. And again, it's up to us, we're the adults, we're the ones who should be creating the environment that makes that really easy for them. And I want to finish by sharing with you this quote. It's my favorite quote of all time. <laughs> it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. We know that you cannot divorce your mental health from your environment. So I invite you all today to think about what we can do to change the environment so that we make it easy for young people and the people who care for them to enjoy a good level of mental health. And I would invite you all to support me because I'm very lucky. I have built a platform, but I'm absolutely determined to use that platform Platform to give a voice to people who have been ignored, people who have been taken advantage of, and people who the government have tried to silence. So I may no longer be the government's mental health champion, but I very much hope that I can continue to be yours. Thank you for listening.